Let me start by saying hello and happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Uh, my name is Ricky Schwartz. For those of you who haven't had a webinar or class with me, I'm president for the Center for Agile Leadership. Proctoring the call today will be Mr. Brian Rabin, CEO and founder of Center for Agile Leadership. I welcome all of you. I see some familiar names in the attendance bar. Thank you so much for keeping our relationship going. It really does mean the world to Brian and to me. So welcome to our webinar on business agility. Um, it's kind of a hot topic these days. It kind of comes and goes. Uh, Brian, you can show the title slide if you like. Um, and Brian, by the way, will be advancing the slides for us. It's a hot topic, so I'm glad I, I kind of kicked off 2020 with it because uh, I think there's some confusion about it. I think there's a lot of chatter about it. I'm going to do my best to refine the topic, but please understand that it's a very broad topic, and there's lots and lots and lots of opinions and attitudes and ideas of what it is. So the best I can do is refine it based on my understanding of it and how CFAL looks at it. Um, we already talked about muting the microphone. We talked about the chat icon. Occasionally, I'll be asking you to type things in the chat box. For now, can you grab a couple of pieces of paper, eight and a half by 11? You should really only need one, but I don't know how big you write, so grab two or three just to be safe. And I'll give you guys a second to do that. Just grab two or three sheets of eight and a half by 11 paper. Okay, so Brian, next slide. Our first objective today is going to be what on earth is business agility and who needs it? It's kind of a combined objective because one kind of leads to the other. Brian, next slide. So at the very top of your 8.5 by 11 piece of paper, write down what you think business agility is, and eventually we're going to compare it to my definition of it, but I'm just going to give you 25 or 30 seconds to write down what do you think it is. I'll give you some time to do that, and then after that, I'm going to ask you to, to, to write a number next to that. But for right now, just write down what you think business agility means or what it is. I'll give you about five, ten more seconds to be thinking about what do you think business agility is? And once you've got that written down, think about that definition and write down next to it on a scale from 1 to 30, and you'll see why it's 30 in a minute. Write down a scale from 1 to 30, how much do you think your organization needs to be business agile? Think about that definition that you just wrote and consider how, how much do you think your organization needs to be business agile? Scale from 0 to 30, where 30 is a whole lot, like a real, real lot, and 0 is, nah, not at all. So I'll give you a few seconds to write that down. Ravi Aragunta. Hi, Ravi. Hey. If you would, Ravi, um, mute your mic for me, just in case there's background noise. And if we need to unmute it later, we can. So I appreciate that. Will do. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Ryan, next slide. The first thing I want to do is remind everybody, next click, Brian, that we're not talking about methodology. We're never going to be discussing agile methodology on this call. We're not talking about scrums and scrum masters and product owners and user stories and sprints. Uh, next slide, next click, Brian. We're talking about an ability. We're talking about business agility as an ability. We're not talking about it as a methodology. And I'm going to remind everybody of that in, in a few slides because you guys are so used to thinking, you who are in the IT industry, you're so used to thinking about Agile as being comprised of various methodologies, which it absolutely is, but business agility does not relate to any of those methodologies in particular. Next slide, Brian. So I'm going to read you 
kind of an amalgamated definition of business agility. If you Google it, you're going to find 17,000 different definitions, and I think I found them all because I wanted to create a definition for purposes of this presentation that really identified the key elements of each definition I found. The, the, the verbiage, the narrative that is included in just about all of them, a common denominator, if you will, and those are those capital letters that are underlined. So in every definition I saw, virtually all of them said it was related to the ability of an organization, so it's an ability, like I said earlier, to rapidly adapt to market and environmental change in profitable ways that bring equal or more value to the customers. Those capitalized and underlined words are in virtually every business agility definition that we see. So what I would say is I'm going to assume that everybody on the call pretty much knows what it means to adapt, uh, given our history and our background. I'm sure you understand what it means to say something is profitable. I'm sure you understand what it means to give someone equal or more value to the customers. So I don't really need to dive really deep into those words, but I, will, I would like to dive into what is meant by market and environmental change. And that's why I put it in gold, in gold font. I really want to talk about what is this market and environmental change, specifically that business agility helps us to adapt to. Brian, next slide. So let's look at the external market environmental change in terms of categories. There are about, and there's probably more, but I picked six categories of environmental change that present the most commonly or the most disruptive changes to the marketplace. And also when I say change, I would really expand that to be market and environmental complexity, or market and environmental uncertainty, or market and environmental change. So all of that is kind of combined into the word change. And, and before we go through those, it's also really important for us to remember that these changes don't always present threats. We think of them as threats because change is often threatening, but they also present opportunities. And a business agile environment can consider these changes to be opportunities and they don't convert them into threats. So all the more reason to have a business agile environment. So business agility isn't just designed to maintain market share during these times of change. It's really designed to increase market share while others who are less agile don't, and they sink. So let's start with the first category of market and environmental change, and that is economic. And economic is, is a very broad term, but it includes downturns or uncertainty or inflation or recession or new competition or market disruption, um, increased globalization. Um, and, and some companies are more resistant to economic change than others, right? I used to work in the waste industry, and we had kind of a running joke that said, well, we're in the midst of recession, but there's always going to be garbage, right? So not every organization is going to be as sensitive to economic downturns. But eventually, even the waste industry, would, if, if the downturn was long enough or severe enough, then sure, it, it impacted our bottom line for darn sure. So let's look at the second category of economic or market environmental change. I'm sorry, market environmental change. I, I know that the IT professionals on this call certainly don't need to be told that technological change out there will impact every organization, most certainly yours. Uh, think about uh, Kodak, Blockbuster, Polaroid, Blackberry, um, the increased need for cybersecurity, which has exploded. These are all things that have dramatically impacted how companies do business, consider their strategies, and so forth. Um, the next one is, is legal. So the next category being legal, and that's, uh, that's awfully broad, right? So I can't begin to give all the examples, but every time there's a change in laws, regulations, liability policies, again, when I was in the waste industry, every time the EPA changed something, the Environmental Protection Agency changed a policy, holy crow, our, our operations and our strategies and our bottom line were seriously impacted. It really meant being understand how to adapt, being able to understand how to adapt to such a significant change in, in legal language and policy and penalties and procedures. 
The next one of the biggest ones, at least for me, is social. And, and social norms, I think, change customer demand and expectations more than we realize sometimes. And the example I like to think of, um, men, forgive me while I go through this example briefly, but the example I like to think of is pantyhose. They were invented in 1959, so what, 60 years ago? And ladies, you may remember them wearing them certainly, certainly to the more uh, formal events and pretty much to work every day, right? I mean, I know I did. So millennials, if you talk to millennials these days, they wouldn't be caught dead in a pair of pantyhose. I don't think that's a shift, frankly, any of us expected. I didn't. I hated pantyhose, but I never expected the social norm to take them away. But just as they were getting phased out, Sarah Blakely, women, again, you'll probably recognize that name, she was smart enough to inspect the benefits of pantyhose, right, as they were getting phased out, and, and which was kind of shaping women in areas where they were more self-conscious, and she adapted to the changing market needs, and what did she invent? Spanx. Thank you, Sarah. So Sarah's net worth today is about $1.1 billion. And when I think about that, I think about Haynes Brand, right? Haynes Brand was the, and may still be, the leading manufacturer of hosiery. But they too, they, didn't, they weren't as quick as Sarah was, but they too started to see the market changing. And what was emerging at that time was women's fitness. So they started to create, and fitness in general, really, fit, fitness for everybody. They started to inspect the market, adapt to it, and they created Champion, those of you who know Champion, that's a, that's a huge name when it comes to men's and women's fitness gear. So they didn't die when hosiery started to get phased out. They inspected and they adapted and they created new divisions such as Champion. So they are a great example of using business agility to stay relevant. They and Sarah, actually. Um, Kodak, on the other hand, wasn't so business agile. I don't think any of us expected Kodak to go away. I mean, they were... Huge, absolutely huge, and seemed to be infinitely huge. And uh, they declared bankruptcy not that long ago. So I think the other thing with regard to social norms, think about the change in focus with regard to sexism, racism, ageism. I was just this morning getting ready for this presentation. I was watching um, uh, uh, Facebook, and a commercial for Cheerios came on. And it was the commercial that features same-sex couples. And I thought, holy smokes. They really took a look at social norms and changed their marketing strategies dramatically. So, and the last one I think of when I think of social is social media, social media, social media. I, I, I don't even remember what it's like not to have Facebook or to get a lot of my information and misinformation from Facebook, but it certainly has become a huge platform for marketing and so forth. Next category of, ex, of market and environmental change is political. And uh, you can ignore the internal organizational. That, that should have come up separately. So let's talk about political first. Far left policies to the right. Uh, I mean, far, uh, far left policies, far right policies. Every administration is going to impact everything from marketing to health care costs to tax law changes. All of that has serious implications when it comes to market disruption. And then the last one that came up with political is internal and we tend to forget that we face huge internal challenges when it comes to change such as retention and turnover if you have a new CEO or a new president and he or she brings with him or her a completely different um, strategy or mindset uh, or oftentimes if you have company-wide initiatives which can often send people into kind of a tailspin while they learn the initiative and try to adapt to the new initiative, all of those create an environment where being able to adapt to change, in other words, being business agile, is extraordinarily important. So let's take a look at those categories one at a time in a different way. Next slide, Brian. Thanks. On that piece of eight and a half by 11 paper on which you wrote down what you thought was the meaning of agility and how high you rated the need for your organization to be business agile, um, Write down these five categories, uh, and we'll go through them one at a time. And then we're going to score zero to five how much or how often you think that category impacts your particular organization, particularly as compared to other organizations.
Where five is the most often or the hardest, impacts you the most often or the hardest. So let's start with the first one, economic change. Brian, there you go. Oh, thank you. One more. So let's start with economic changes. At a scale from one to five, write that down and score the change, score that change category with how hard or how often they impact your organization. And five is the most and zero is not at all. So think about how much and how hard do economic changes impact your organization, zero to five. And again, like I mentioned, some organizations are much more economic market dependent or resistant to downturns than others. So I don't want everybody to assume it's just a five, because if you think about your organization, maybe it's less. I don't know. A uh, garbage organization, when I was in it, I would have given it like a three and a half. So that's my example. Okay, let's look at technological changes, the next one. Again, on a scale from zero to five, write down... How hard or how often do you think technological changes impact your organization? Okay, next one. Legal changes. On a scale from one to five, zero to five, score the change category, score it, I'm so sorry, score it in terms of how hard or how often do legal changes external to your company impact your organization? How hard or how often? Okay, next one, the social changes that we talked about. And I have lots of examples of those. Social norms, social media, anything social in exchange to your company. Scale from zero to five, how hard or how often do social changes impact your organization? Next one, political changes. How often or how hard do political changes impact your organization? And lastly, again, that one popped up at the same time, internal changes. And again, how right now, when you think about your organization or in the past, if you've gotten a new senior member, or you've gotten a new SLT, or you've gone through new initiatives, or you have faced unusual retention issues or turnover issues, how hard or how often have they impacted your organization? And then lastly, go ahead and add that score up. Brian, hit that click. What's your organization's total score? It'll be out of 30. What's your organization's total score? And by the way, and I should have mentioned this earlier, this isn't any kind of forced ranking, right? I should, that should be clear because there's six categories and zero to five, but Everyone is ranked, uh, everyone is scored, if you will, individually. It's not force ranked at all. So now kind of put, put that aside, understand the organization's total score out of 30 was whatever it was, and then ask yourself this question. Should my organization be concerned with business agility? And I would argue that if your score is, I don't know, 15 to 30, which is 50%, then probably, or even more importantly, if any of those categories, you scored a five, then I would say definitely. That means you are more vulnerable and need to adapt more quickly and more efficiently to environmental and market change. So think about this slide as you plan your next business agile conversation, either with yourself or with others. Okay, next slide, Brian. So that was our first learning objective. Our second one and our final one is, does my organization's culture actually support business agility? So if you had a number between 15 and 30, or you had a, a category that was scored four or five, um, then I think your next question to yourself is going to be, does my organization support business agility? Because clearly we need to, or we need it. Um, so a lot of times you're going to see from here on out, the, even the title on this slide, it doesn't say, is my business agile? Because I, I think that's a question that you need to answer in, in smaller bites. Instead, I refer in all of the slides, including this one to follow, does my organization's culture support business agility? 
Because if you don't have an enterprise-wide culture that supports it, you can't really answer the question whether my business is agile. As usual, for those of you who are taking our classes, as usual, it all boils down to culture. So everything for the rest of the presentation is going to be talking about whether your culture supports business agility. Next slide. So we're going to be doing a quick assessment of your culture uh, in the next few slides it's going to, in, in a couple of minutes. And we're going to score some of the key building blocks of business agility cultures. So the total possible score is going to be 200 when we get through that. But before we do that, turn over that piece of paper that you've been writing on so far. And at the top of the back of it, write down what grade right now without doing an assessment, what grade would you give the culture at your organization in terms of whether it supports business agility? And what number would you give it? So for example, just a random example, you might write down B minus with 163 points. Or you might write down A plus with 200 points. Whatever it is, put down a grade and put down the numbers. And after we do the assessment, I'm going to have you look back and see how close you were. So I'll give everybody a second to think about that. How business agile is your organization's culture? Okay, Brian. So again, I want to remind everybody what business agility is not. Next click. It is not a methodology. We are not talking about the methodologies that you guys are so familiar with. And I would say that the ability, right? Remember we called that business agility is an ability? That ability is mastered when an organization extends the core values that allow for those agile methodologies that we're so fond of to work. That's the key. The agile methodologies that we all know and love, in order for them to work, we need to extend a certain number of core values. And we need to extend them not just within IT, but we need to extend them to the rest of the organization. Because that's all business agility really is, extending the core values, not the methodologies, of Agile to the entire organization. And that's why Brian conceived Center for Agile Leadership. His, his brainchild was to teach the application of these core values that support Agile leadership in any department, in any company, in any industry. And that's why we don't talk about user stories and sprints and product owners and scrums in our class we talk about core values almost exclusively. So with that in mind, what are the core values that support agile leadership and therefore support business agility? We're going to go over five big ones. I'm not going to go really slowly because you're all really familiar with them because most of you have taken our classes. But in the event I have a newcomer, I will go through them kind of medium speed. So let's start with being people-centric. Some people call it human-centric. I have that little formula that I invented in the parentheses, I plus I over P plus P, because I like to remind people to, to put individuals and in interactions over policies and procedures. People over paper is another way I sometimes refer to it. So in that case, we're looking at what the culture values more. Is it people or is it paper? The next one is inspect and adapt. We're all very familiar with that. And if I'm going to break that down, there's lots of ways to say it, but make frequent small changes. Inspect and adapt. Fail fast, fail often. Pivot is needed, blah, blah, blah. It basically means don't lay out your entire project on day one and expect it to stay the same two years later and try to budget for it and try to prepare for all um, things that can change. Instead, little tiny pieces that you respond to at a time, inspect and adapt. Third one, move away from command and control. And essentially that means turning your organizational chart upside down and letting the field of the frontline people make key decisions instead of relying on senior leadership to do so. It, it, it's, a, it's the idea that it's the field people that know more about the operations and the implications of a changing environment than perhaps the folks who aren't in the field every single day. So that's why it's so important during times of change to be able to rely on the field frontline folks instead of trying to have the senior leadership have every answer to every change. The next one, nurture collaboration and transparency. So 
I, I say that in two regards, both within our teams and then between our teams and our customers. So starting with within our teams. Collaboration and transparency eliminates the competition mentality. It eliminates the every man for himself mentality. It eliminates the if you make a poor decision, you're on your own mentality. Because the end goal of Agile teams, as you know, is to foster self-organizing, self-managing teams who are empowered and engaged enough to make those decisions and aren't afraid to do so. So it, 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 it takes us away from the I decided to do such and such with the we decided to do such and such. It truly is a team mentality. And next is the hardest one, I think, for leaders to get comfortable with. Encourage experimentation and risks. I just gave a presentation to a very large corporation a couple weeks ago, and I got to this one, and I could see the managers kind of bristle, particularly when I got to sale fast, sale often. And one of them raised their hands, or I think I may have sensed his body language, and I said, you seem uncomfortable. And he said, I, I don't want to encourage my folks to fail at all. And I said, well, I will tell you that, that risk comes with failure. And if you don't encourage that level of risk, then pantyhose don't turn into specs, plain and simple. So I know it's a hard one to grasp. But to me, it's one of the most important ones. How can we possibly adapt to a change in the market or the environment that we didn't expect if we're not willing to have our folks come up with solutions that we didn't expect. So encourage risks and experimentation. And also I'm going to I'm going to beat this horse one more time. These values can't just be embraced in IT. They have to be embraced company wide. So values are what make up a culture and cultures don't just sit in one department. That's why CFAL Center for Agile Leadership thinks it's so important to teach everyone how to influence an enterprise-wide culture. So thanks, Brian. So let's let's now do a quick down and dirty assessment of your culture. I'm going to go through each of those four core values slide by slide by slide. And if you go back to the sheet of your paper where you wrote down, for example, B minus 163 points, write down each core value as I go through it. And, uh, and beneath each value, you're going to answer the four questions you see below. I mean, he's going to pop them up in just a second. You're going to answer four questions with a 1 to 10 score. So let's look at the first question you're going to ask yourself as we go through each core value. The first question you're going to ask yourself is on a, on a scale from 0 to 10, how well do I, as a leader, promote this core value? Second question, I'm going to ask myself, and you guys don't have to write this down. It'll be on every slide. Second question you're going to ask yourself, how well does my direct manager promote this core value? Scale from 1 to 10. The third question you're going to ask yourself, how well does your organization's senior leadership team promote this core value? And lastly, you're going to ask yourself, how well does your organization how, as a whole embrace this core value? So if you look at this, you notice I'm, I'm expanding out what I'm referring to later in the presentation as titles or job titles. I'm expanding them out, starting with you, to your direct manager, to your manager's managers, and to the organization as a whole. That's the idea behind this assessment. We're going to kind of spread our arms and see how far the, the core values extend beyond ourselves. So let's start with the first core value. The people, oh, by the way, we are going to total each score for each value. Thanks, Brian. Total the score for each value. So let's start with being people-centric. Core value of being people-centric. On that piece of paper underneath where you put your B minus 162 points or whatever it was, Go ahead and write down one through four, you, direct manager, senior leadership and organization. And then how well do you, as a leader, promote the core value of people-centric? How well do you um, believe in people over processes, humans over paper? And the next one, how well does your direct manager? Nope, yep, same thing. How well does, nope, go back, Brian. We're still on, peop, uh, go back. People-centric. How well do you embrace people-centric value? How well does your direct manager, again, scale from 0 to 10? How well does your senior leadership team embrace people-centricity? And how well does your organization as a whole embrace it? Score each one 0 to 10 and then total your score for just this value. I'll give you just a second to do that, and then we'll go to the next core value. Okay, 
Next core value, inspect and adapt. So we're going to do the same exact thing for each of those titles or job titles or as I've been referring to it. How well does each of those categories of people promote making frequent small changes, inspecting and adapting, failing fast and failing often? How well do you do it? How well does your direct manager do it? How well does your senior leadership team do it? And how well does your organization as a whole do it? Consider that and give yourself a score for the value, a total score. Okay, let's go to the next one, which is moving away from command and control. How well do you and everybody else, scale from 0 to 10, how well do you promote letting the field and your frontline folks make those key decisions instead of micromanaging them? How well do you let them be autonomous, empower them, engage them, such that they feel a responsibility to be able to make these decisions on their own? How well do you do it, your direct manager, your senior leadership team, and your organization as a whole? I'll give you a few seconds to score those and put a total score. Okay. And next one is nurture collaboration and transparency. So again, Think about whether collaboration is favored over competition. Think about how much self-organizing and self-managing teams are encouraged and supported. Think about whether we're transparent with our customers and we think about them as being on our team or that we're negotiating with them kind of behind the scenes and whatever they get, they get, and whatever we get, we get. How much is collaboration and transparency embraced by you, your direct manager, your SLT, and your organization as a whole? And I'll give you a few seconds to do that. And the last one, encouraging risks and experimentation. Think about whether you and those other job titles, if you will, encourage folks to fail fast and fail often. You, your direct manager, your SLT, and your organization. Go ahead and score those, 0 to 10, and put a total at the bottom. All right, so let's take a look at our scores. Um, on the bottom of the same piece of paper, go ahead and click, Brian. Uh, you're going to first figure out your total points. How many out of 200 total points did you have for all the core values combined? So I will let you do that quick tally. Again, there's 200 total points. You're going to add the totals at the bottom of each core and see how close you came to 200. All right, next is what core value had the highest score out of a total possible score of 40? Which of those core values gave you your highest score, total possible score of 40? Was it Risk? Was it being people-centric? Was it moving away from command and control? Which core had the highest score? Next question, which core value had the lowest score? Which one had the lowest score out of 40? Again, was it being people-centric? Was it uh, encouraging your folks to be Take risks and experiment. Which one was it? All right, let's take a look at those job titles, or titles as I've been calling them. Which was it? Was it you? Was it your manager? Was it the SLT? Or was it the whole organization that had the highest total score out of 50? Which one of those titles, you, your manager, the SLT of the whole organization, had the highest total score out of 50? And 
And lastly, which job classification you, your manager, your SLT, the whole organization, had the lowest total score out of 50? Lowest total score. So we've looked at two things, right? We've looked at which core values are thriving in your organization, and we're looking at which sections of the organization are doing the best at supporting them. We kind of looked at both simultaneously. So what do the scores tell you? Well, hopefully, now that you, you've identified a pretty good assessment of your culture with regard to business agilities, or at least the core values that facilitate them, you can gauge a few things. First of all, you take a look and see, <coughs> pardon me, how close was the total that you got, item one? How close was that total score to what you estimated your culture, how your culture was doing in terms of business agility at the beginning of this module? So you gave yourself a guess. You gave yourself a B minus or a C plus or an A plus, and you gave yourself a number of points at the beginning of this module. How close did you come with regard to number one out of 200? How close did you come? So I think it's a good gauge that kind of says, are you where you thought you were? Where do you need to be? Or if you're doing great. So that's the first thing that I was hoping this assessment would, would, would serve to gauge. The second thing I was thinking is it shows you which core values need some work. That becomes pretty obvious. If you have a core value on any of your five listed core values and it has a really score, a little really low score, then probably that's a core value you need to work on. And lastly, like I said, we looked at this kind of at the same time. My guess, and I'm only speculating, is that as you scored the titles in terms of how much they embrace each value, the score for you was probably a little higher than or could have been a little higher than the score for your manager, which was probably – um, a little lower than the score for your SLT, which was probably a little lower than your score for the whole organization. So my speculation is that as you fan outside of yourself and IT, fewer and fewer people are able to fully embrace or are fully embracing those core values in their culture, in your culture. And that's why organizations that teach influencing culture is so important because we've got to get people to start thinking about culture as an enterprise-wide endeavor. It can't be limited to silos here and silos there. It can't be limited to just you being good at it, but the whole organization hasn't sensed the change. Or it can't be good at you and your manager being good at it when the SLT doesn't even understand some of the core values. It has to fan out. It has to have those numbers be constant or even better as you get to the broader sections of your organization. So that's why I think it's an important assessment. Next slide. My overall argument in terms of the organizations that as a whole embrace Agile core values is that they, it results in three organizational qualities. Creativity. Adaptivity, and lastly, being resilient, resiliency. So in my mind, the one is married to the other. It is hard for me to imagine an entire organization that's creative, adaptive, and resilient, that have those qualities if they don't practice the core values we just went over. And it's also equally or more difficult for me to imagine an organization that responds to change well market and environmental change or internal change if they're not created Embrace that core value. If you did a great job, but as you went to your senior leadership, it went, the numbers got lower, that's an even bigger indication that you're going to need to consider whether 
influencing the culture within your silo is going to really do you much good? And how do we get that culture influence to expand beyond yourself, to your manager, to the SLC, and to the organization? So next slide. That's a you are here slide. And as you're looking at the things I said that baseline assessment would gauge, as you're looking at which core values you haven't embraced completely, or the folks that, that are on the org chart separate from you haven't embraced completely, begin to formulate what that means for your culture. And consider how you can use those core values to lead cultural change from your own chairs. But I want you to pay attention to the fact that I didn't just say use those values to change your culture. We always say lead your culture or influence your culture. Because attempts to, to literally change your culture will inevitably end with either if you try to change your culture abruptly, the, the employees either get confused or they resent it or in general, it ends up with a long, painful, expensive, generally unsustainable series of results. And the best example I can think of, and I always come back to this, mostly because I live in Michigan, so I saw it firsthand. If you think of the culture class when it came to the management style that took place when the German company Daimler took over Chrysler in the late 90s, the Germans did not understand the American way of thinking at all and certainly did not agree with our management style. They believed that we were too unstructured. We believed that they were too rigid and formal. Uh, but the German leadership tried for years to change Chrysler from one culture to the other. They were prone to analyze the problem in great detail, find a solution, discuss it with their partners, and make a decision. Very, very structured. The Americans, on the other hand, it started with discussion, then came a solution, then they discussed it. Then they, uh, then, then they discussed it with themselves and other people. Then they came back to the process and, process and they did it again. In a sense, although I don't think they defined it as agile, certainly the Americans were a great deal more agile than the Germans were coming into the process. Eventually, the Daimler-Benz executives found the American process to be too chaotic, and they said, okay, fine. You are going to keep returning to a subject till it's been settled. We're tired. We're going to give up and have every side organize themselves as they did before the merger. And I can tell you that to this day, that's kind of how it is. Daimler Chrysler really has stick, stuck to a much more regimented, process-oriented way of uh, um, making decisions, and the Americans are much more agile in their approach. As a result, I would love to teach agile leadership to Daimler Chrysler, but I'm not sure that's ever going to happen. Um, so what does that tell you? In general, that example is just there so I, I can reiterate that forcing change just doesn't work. But we can lead it and we can influence it by giving the why behind the targeted culture shift and then modeling the core values we've been discussing. Always goes back to core values. So what Center for Agile Leadership did was we created two classes of how to influence your culture. So the first one is the one day Kickstarter. And this is a really popular class because it really gives people the down and dirty of how to lead cultural transformation. You notice it doesn't say make cultural transformation, we lead it. So it's a wonderful Kickstarter. Information for the class is of course on our website. The URL is there. When I send the slides to everybody of this presentation, we'll of course have this page in there. So that's our one day Kickstarter and our two day class really drills down even deeper. It's a certified class. Again, URL is there. When you get the slides, you'll have this information in hand. I think I bring that up only because <laughs> Brian truly, truly conceived his company because he wanted to help people expand agility beyond the IT departments. He didn't call it business agility. He didn't refer to it as business agility. But that's what it is. It's simply expanding agile leadership into an enterprise-wide culture. So the last slide is simply enough. Does anybody have any questions or comments? So if anybody has any questions or comments, go ahead and unmute your mic and throw them at us. I've answered every question when it comes to business agility. I'm that good. 
to what extent are there, to what extent do uh, systems support the cultural change? I've seen from uh, Leading Agile, a lot of their talk is about the system really helps drive the changing culture as you're implementing Agile to large uh, organizations. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I'm a systems I'm a systems girl, so I always think that systems lead change. But I would say that until the core values have changed, you wouldn't even be able to decide on a system. So I, I and we want to always keep the PMP over the INI, so or the INI over the PMP. So I would say it, it's inevitably going to result in a system change. Yes. But I'd love to see people focus in the beginning more on the core values. Does that sort of address your question? Yeah, yeah, sir. Okay. Any other comments on that from anybody or, or the gentleman who just asked the question? And Brian, do you have any co comments on that? Because systems questions are certainly in your bailiwick as well. Can you hear me now, Ricky? I can. Uh, I, I've noticed a couple things in the Agile space over the last 20 years. Um, some people are very tool-centric and some people are very people-centric. And there have been some really large Agile tools, um, Rally, version 1, and I've seen a lot of people attempt to use those tools to drive their Agile adoptions oh, to very on. limited success. Um, generally speaking, the, the tool is a tool and it has certain limitations and has certain flows and they, uh, they kind of drive a certain way of doing things that isn't necessarily Agile because the point of Agile, back to Ricky's point, was it's all about the individuals and the interactions. It's all about the people. And if you use a, a system or a tool that helps drive things, yeah, it might help, you know, give you some guideposts of where you are, but um, if, you're, if you're working through that too rigidly, then I, I think by definition you're almost anti-Agile um, because Agile, again, is about all about individuals and interactions. And the way we've developed our, our culture classes is really specifically to focus on the people side of things. And like Ricky said, you know, it starts with the core values, but I mean, that's just, that's just the beginning. Um, and it, it really is about the people. And, and in my experience, what I've seen more of is when you have a powerful leader who is really bought in and is really kind of agile in themselves, I mean, they're just naturally an agile leader, they typically have more success driving cultural change and agile transformations than somebody's coming in and using some type of system or, or program to try to drive that change. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. Thanks. Good. Any other questions? That was a great question. Thank you. Any other questions about anything we talked about? Hello, this is Ed. I have a question. Um, on the core values, is there like, if you could only choose one, is there a ranking of the core values that maybe one you would rank a little higher or a little more important than the others? Or if you had to go after um, changing, would you focus on one rather than the other? Kind of like a hierarchy or a priority of these values, or, there, or you consider all of them equal? You know what, Brian, I'm going to let you answer. I have some thoughts, but I'm going to let you answer because you have a lot more experience with watching people implement them and what kind of ranking worked for them. Well, Ricky, you're, uh, let me try to go back to that, that slide real quick. Yeah, thank you. You have slightly different values than... Yeah, they are. I combined some. So slide 11, I believe. If you go to slide 11, you should. There it is. There you go. Well, not to beat the dead horse, um, but <laughs> back to people-centric first. If, if we put the emphasis on the people, we paint a powerful and compelling vision for why we need to change, and then we give those people uh, accountability for the change and get out of their way and let them fail, then I think we're off to a really, really good start. So that, that's kind of first uh, in my mind. 
Um, second, I would say um, inspect and adapt here because that's um, back to at the point I just said failure. Um, we learn from our failures and if we inspect and adapt and, and make positive change and try new things, then we're, we're growing. Um, let's see, I think next I would say uh, nurture collaboration and transparency. Uh, an agile organization by nature is, is very transparent and the collaboration kind of happens organically. Uh, then I would put um, encourage risk and experimentation. Uh, again, that's kind of back to, to failing fast and failing often. But uh, as a leader, we have to be willing to uh, allow risk and experimentation within our organizations. Otherwise, we, we don't grow. And then uh, the last one up there, I'll put move away from uh, command and control. Uh, we we don't want command and control to be the only way that we lead as an Agile leader, but there are times when we actually need um, some command and control. And so at the very beginning of any kind of growth or new hire, um, you, you almost have to tell people what you expect and, and sometimes even how to do the job until they have enough um, freedom and, and knowledge and, and failure under their belts to move. Um, away from the need for command and control. So command and control by itself is not a dirty word. It, it's simply um, not the tool we want to always use if we're an Agile leader. And I would piggyback, thanks Brian, I would piggyback on, that and piggyback on that and say that I think what you'll find is, oh Brian, can we go back to that? Thank you. Is that if you follow being people-centric, encouraging risk and experimentation and inspecting and adapting, I suspect that one or more of those will follow as you do each one. One kind of organically leads to the other. So I, I, I would encourage everyone not to think about, first we'll do this and then we'll focus on this, then we'll do this. I would think about paying attention to which of those core values begin to grow from which other core values. And then just keep checking back and say, okay, we've been doing this for a while. Let's look at these core values. Have we gotten to the point where we're nurturing collaboration and transparency? If we haven't, then I'm wondering if we got away from the concept of command and control. Maybe we need to go back to that. So in my mind, they kind of flow into each other and they serve as a good double check. How well did we, um, embrace this core value if this one never got embraced. So that's how I would answer that. Does that help? Oh, yes. Thank you very much. That was You're wonderful. welcome. Thank you, Ed. Any other questions? Hey, Ricky and Brian, Kim Reynolds. Hey, hey, so when we think about our verbiage, the words we use, like glossary, if you will, how important is that uh, when you're trying to look at these five core values and, and influence change? Well, I have two answers for that. The first one is I'm, I'm extremely word-oriented, but I'm a little bit unusual in that regard. So I, my answer is going to be slightly biased. So I'm hesitant to say, oh, my gosh, the word is the most important thing in the world. A better answer, a less biased answer, because, of course, I'm a writer, so I always think we're, my words are the only words. But I think a less biased answer would be you're going to know which words your organization will resonate with. You as the leader know much better. If command and control is going to make them bristle because it makes them feel like uh, you've turned them into the Air Force and they don't like being compared to a military organization, then don't say command and control. Say micromanage. Everybody's familiar with micromanage. So I would be very sensitive to the narrative that your company uses expressly and play into that. You can challenge people using their own language much better than you can challenge people using new and, for example, a Daimler Chrysler language. Make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. So well, let me ask you a question. So here, at, you know, we're at Ashley Furniture, and Brian, I loved your Cal 1 class. Loved it, loved it, but that was so long ago. 
I no, want to get funding to take more courses. And there's now three coaches here at Ashley Resident Coaches. So for a bargaining chip, I can, you know, you're going to send this deck out. I can present this to, you know, my uh, the executive vice president that we report to. And um, when we come at it, if we were to be able to take this two-day course, can you kind of provide an insight as to what would we have a better, uh, would we be more capable of starting this transformation, yes. if you will? Yes, I, I would. That's why I happen to be so proud of both curriculums, the one-day and the two-day curriculum, because both of them create what I'll call realistic and sustainable ways of influencing your culture. We don't barge in like Daimler Chrysler and say, this is how you have to tell your people how to behave. It doesn't work. It creates resentment. Instead, we spend that day or those two days saying, here's what we want you to get as a result. Here are some really good ways to influence that result, to grow it beyond yourself. That's our focus. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. All right, unfortunately, we are at our end of our time box. So lastly, let me just show you, if you go to our website and uh, free upcoming webinars, you've probably already found this. But we have our next one on April 24th, and I'll be talking about the difference between doing Agile and being Agile. Um, we should have the registration link there in the next day or so. So please come back to this page and sign up for the next webinar. Thank you very much for your time, and happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you.